Hi, Andrew Wolf here. In this video, I'm going to talk about the basics of tubular reabsorption. And so I'm going to start out here with uh, Bowman's capsule. Now, I want people to remember that we need to reabsorb the vast majority of the water and electrolytes that we uh, that start out as filtrate in Bowman's capsule. Because remember, the filtrate that comes from the glomerulus is um, a very large quantity. In fact, it's 120 mLs per minute of everything we have in plasma minus most of the proteins, right? Plasma without proteins. And there's, you know, there's a few proteins that slip in, but essentially it's plasma without proteins. So 120 mLs per minute. And, you know, if you do the math on that, I believe it comes out to about 48 liters per day. Now, obviously, nobody can survive um, if they are not reabsorbing any of their filtrate because you can't survive if you are um, urinating 48 liters per day with all the electrolytes, the sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium, and all the important electrolytes. There's no way that you could replace them, right? So we need to reabsorb most of this. Now most of this reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubules. The loop of Henle is primarily um, spends its, its effort on the concentration of urine and then there is more um, reabsorption that occurs in the distal convoluted tubule and a, very little in the collecting duct. So most of what we're going to be talking about now is occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. So, and I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty, I just want you to understand sort of the concept of what's occurring. So what we have here is the vasorecta, which is the capillaries that, that are wrapped around the tubules. And, you know, we've got obviously, we've the vasorecta is made is like all other capillaries is made up of a thin layer of, of one single layer of endothelial cells and a basement membrane and then on the other side of that are the peritubular epithelial cells which are made up of a single layer of cuboidal simple cuboidal epithelium So on the inside here, so we have the basilar surface of these cuboidal epithelium cells up, up against the vasorecta, the capillaries, and the apical sur surface is pointing into the lumen of the tubules, okay? So at the apical surface, actually let me start out at the basilar surface, and I'm going to draw one big giant cell so we can see what we're talking about here. So here at the basilar surface we have some ion pumps, most important among them, just like it's most important everywhere else in the body, is our friend the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So what does the sodium potassium ATPase pump do, do? Well, it pumps out three sodium in exchange for three potassium coming in. And in order to do this, remember it's pumping against concentration gradients, right? Because there's more sodium on the outside than there is on the inside. So we're pumping against the concentration gradient. The opposite is true with potassium, where we have, you know, we have 4.5 on the outside and 140 or so on the inside. So this exchange again is occurring at the basilar surface. Sodium out, potassium in. And remember this is a sodium potassium ace pump so this takes energy. 
And interestingly enough, because the kidneys rely so much on active transport using ATP, they are actually some of the more highly metabolically active um, cells inside the body, so the kidneys require a lot of oxygen and a lot of energy. because of all this ATP. So there's lots and lots of mitochondria inside these cells. And I think some, sometimes people don't appreciate that, that these are high energy cells and the kidneys do not like low flow environments and they don't like um, low oxygen environments. Those of you who have worked with surgical patients um, like I have, you know that um, patients that go to surgery and have, and have hypotension have a low blood pressure, you know, down in the 60s or 70s with systolic pr blood pressure in the 60s or 70s um, for more than a few minutes can often develop acute kidney injury. And they develop acute kidney injury because um, these cells um, are damaged because of ischemia very, very easily. Uh, just keep that in mind. High, that are very highly metabolic cells. These are not passive cells. These are cells that are doing hard work all the time, pumping ions. So we have this active pump at the basilar surface of the cell. And at the apical surface of the cell, we actually have um, co-transporters. For instance, we have a sodium glucose co-transporter. And what's this doing? Well, remember, the sodium out here is concentrated, just like it is in plasma, and the sodium in here is not concentrated. So sodium is just passively writing down its concentration gradient, and this co-transporter is a protein that's um, set up to have two things come in together, so it, it rides the glucose in along with the sodium. So this is called the sodium glucose co-transporter. And this is an example of secondary active transport. Now another important co-transporter to be aware of, and we're going to talk about this when we talk about the concentration of urine, is, let me draw this here, is called the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. And what it, it does is it transports one sodium ion, one potassium ion, and two chloride ions. And again, all of this is being driven by sodium going down its concentration gradient. So this is the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. And again, it's an example of secondary active transport. So it's active transport because it's relying on the passive energy of concentration gradients that have been set up by the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So the energy is coming from the ATP of the sodium potassium ATPase pump that's setting up a concentration gradient of sodium and that concentration gradient of sodium is used to drive the these other coast transporter pumps. Now there's another pump that I wanted to mention. There's another type of secondary active transport and it's called counter transport. Now the there's a counter transport. The most famous one that I'm aware of is called the sodium hydrogen counter transport. And what it does is again it's using the passive energy or the potential energy of the concentration gradient of sodium to pull sodium in in exchange for hydrogen going out. So this again is an example of secondary active transport but instead of a co-transport it is a counter 
transport. Okay, so, and this is a very important mechanism for controlling acid base balance within the kidney because it allows for the excretion of hydrogen ions. And again, it's using, it's using energy, but secondarily via, um, via the sodium um, concentration gradient. Now there's a few other things that happen with these cells. One is, um, now I talked about how the uh, glomerulus allows very few proteins to get into the filtrate, but there are some that do. The ones that do, let's draw a little protein here, are actually absorbed into the cell by pinocytosis. So the cell actually sort of wraps itself around the protein, brings it in, engulfs it within the cell, and pulls it in. Now this is a process again that takes energy as well. And then this is again excreted into the vasorecta. Um, and there's some other processes as well. Now the sodium potassium ATPase pump is not the only other active ion pumps include the sodium potassium uh, include the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. Um, there is a calcium ATPase pump and a hydrogen ATPase pump, among others. So there are a number of active pumps as well. These are not the only ones. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about some things that happen in specific places here in, in the body. Now, sodium is actively um, reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, and water is following it. So by the time you get to the end of the proximal tubule and down to the loop of Henle, um, we have reabsorbed a significant amount of sodium and water. But the osmolarity remains the same. The osmolarity remains 300 microosms per liter, which is exactly the same as what it is in plasma. So that just means that, that water and sodium are equally being reabsorbed at the same rate. So by the time you get to the top of the loop of Henle, it's still, you're still at, at 300 microosms. So um, keep that in mind. Other things that are very actively absorbed in the proximal tubules include glucose and proteins are absorbed by phenocytosis proteins and amino acids. Now glucose and proteins are absorbed so quickly in, um, in the proximal convoluted tubule that there are that in normal kidneys there is no glucose or proteins by the time you get to the loop of Henle. So these are completely reabsorbed only in the proximal tubule. Now in, in the distal tubule, at times of potassium in the body, this is where we tend to excrete uh, large amounts of, of potassium. And we also um, tend to excrete our creatinine here. Okay, I hope this video was helpful to you. Please provide feedback by giving me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. and. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments below. If you have questions, I'll, I'll be glad to try to answer them if I'm able. And I'm going to put up a few links here for you to um, quickly link, have easy access to my other videos. And I hope to see you in the future. Thank you.